stupid. The brain is chemically influenced and dulled. So a soldier going out to battle who gets very, very angry, he's angry at the enemy, in one sense that's good for him. Because he won't go out there so frightened that he freezes in place and cries for his mommy. But when you're dealing with somebody you love, not with an enemy, where it's a mortal contest, the anger will make you harsh, insensitive, unaware of what's going on, self-righteous. And Torah says you need to get rid of the anger before you take action or before you speak. Now, what can you say? What do you need to say? Certainly people say to me, but doctor, psychologists have said if you suppress your anger, if you hold it all inside, you get sick. It's true. But doctors have also said, if you express anger a lot, chas v'sholom, a person also gets sick. Different organs. So what does a person do? I said anger has two parts. I feel hurt, and it's your fault. What you need to express is the hurt, not the judgment, not the blame. You're not a dayan. You're not a posek. You're a nogea badovor. You are, have a vested interest in the middle of this. You can't trust your own interpretation. You're not in a position to paskin, to make a judgment, and to moralize, to musr, the other person. What you can say is, I feel very bad when you do that. Gives the other person an opportunity to explain where they're coming from. They can't tell you you're wrong. I'm telling you, I feel bad. That's a fact. I, I'm the only one who knows whether I feel bad. Now, whether you're right or, you're, or, or I'm right, that could be content for an argument. But I'm just telling you, what you did, I feel very bad about. Maybe you will decide, well, you don't want to do it. Not because you think I'm right, not because I won an argument, but you understand, I really feel bad when you do that. I know you don't like my sister. And I know my sister's a very difficult person. And she was wrong and rude in what she says. But when you act rudely to her back, it makes me feel very bad. Because even though she's a rude person, I love her. All right, honey. I will try for your sake. You know, I'm not going to let her get to me. A very useful thing to say, in addition to sharing that you feel hurt, the three best words you can learn from a marital therapist, worth gold. The three words are, I don't understand. The person hurt you, you say to them, I don't understand why you would do that. Now, first of all, that communicates, I haven't come to a psak based on the advice of my counselor, the Eight Sahara. I haven't come to a psak. I'm not saying you're a bad person. Quite the reverse. I know you're a good person. And for the life of me, I can't understand why a good person like you would do that to me. I explain to me. I am conveying to you that I basically see you as a good person. And I'm getting a chance to hear what you have to say. Maybe I'm not seeing it from your point of view. Maybe I didn't see what I did that then made you do what you did. Maybe I didn't understand your intention. Maybe your intention was good. This all involves talking without anger.
two more points about talking. The, the word, we tend to talk about communication. Are we communicating? Every time a person says something to you, they want something from you. Shalom Aleichem. I expect back, ah, Shalom Aleichem. I made the overture. I want that enthusiastic Shalom Aleichem as, oh, you like me. Otherwise, I just would have walked by you in shul. I wouldn't have had to say anything. One of the things that gets people into trouble when they're hurt is they start to argue. What does argue mean? You present your point of view. While you're presenting it, I'm only half listening because I am already preparing my rebuttal. You finish if I let you. I probably catch you on a mistake. That's not true. It happened on Tuesday. It didn't happen on Monday. It happened in the morning. It didn't happen in the evening. And I give you my Dvar Torah. You probably interrupt me, and then we talk louder and louder to see who's going to grab the floor. The basic solution to this, psychologists say, is let the other person speak. Do not interrupt and wait. If they breathe, that is not an invitation to start speaking. If there's a long pause, say, have you finished? Have you said what you needed to say? Or is there more you need to tell me? There's a story. Do I have time for a story? There's a story. A professor who was Baal Tshuva, he was starting to be a little shtickle of Baal Tshuva, decided he wanted to learn about the Kabbalah. And he studied, and as he studied, he wrote a few books, Introduction to Kabbalah, Kabbalah for Dummies, Advanced Kabbalah, but he decided he'd never met a real Kabbalist, a never real Makubal in his life, and he thought he ought to do that. So he packs up his books, he goes to... Israel, goes into the Judean desert where there's a cave in the mountains where there's a Makubal who's a hermit who lives there. And he gets permission to see the Makubal. He comes in, the Makubal has a table there, and he brings his book. He says, Rabbi so-and-so, I want you to know I am Professor so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I hold the endowed chair in Jewish studies at such and such university. I've come to talk with you. I've brought you copies of my books. Puts them on the table. The Makobel says, that's fine. But first, we should share a cup of tea. Takes his teapot, puts a teacup out there, he starts pouring. The Professor is saying, oh my gosh, he's teaching me some great Kabbalistic tea ritual. He's watching and watching. The Makubal keeps pouring and pouring. The cup starts to overflow. He says, I know about that. Kosi Rivaya, my cup overrunneth. This is a mystical something. Or other. This is terrific. But the Makubal keeps pouring. The tea is spilling all over the table, and it's starting to run down towards his pile of books. He grabs his books, 